we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit to open our hearts to the word of truth which is spoken here today. Cause us to mature in our faith, to have a deeper love for you and for one another. Give to each one of those worshipers gathered here this morning the gifts of patience, kindness, and gentleness, that we may help family and neighbor, that we may be forgiving, and that we may live in harmony with all people. May our voices this morning lifted together this hour serve not only to glorify you, our God, but also to mutually comfort and strengthen one another. All of this we ask in your name. Amen. Please rise. The hymn which we just sung this morning emphasizes one of the major themes which we will see in our scripture readings this morning, and that is that human nature has fallen and it has rejected both the will and the word of the Lord. And yet in that final verse, we also sung of the gospel, which emphasizes that in spite of our fallen nature, the Lord has redeemed us through his son and that he has brought us into his kingdom through his death. We'll be emphasizing both the preaching of the law and the gospel throughout our service this morning. We'll be following the order of worship which is found in the blue insert in your bulletin. We begin our worship this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, 
Let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, imploring him in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto Thee that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against Thee by thought, word, and deed. Therefore we flee for refuge to Thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring Thy grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who hast given Thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by thy Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of thee and of thy will, and true obedience to thy word, to the end that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given His only Son to die for us. For His sake, He forgives us all of our sins. To them that believe on His name, He gives the power to become the sons of God and has promised them His Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus, we pray for your Holy Spirit so that even we who cannot do anything good apart from you may place our trust alone in your merit for salvation and have your gift of power to love according to your will. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading for this seventh Sunday after Trinity is found in the words of the Old Testament prophet Amos. Amos has an interesting background. If you remember the period of the divided kingdom in the time of the Old Testament, there was the northern tribe of Israel and the southern tribe of Judah. Amos was from the region of Judah, but sent by the Lord into the northern kingdom, which was godless and rebelling against him, in order to proclaim God's judgment against their wickedness. In the verses that we're reading this morning, we hear how the world rejected that message of Amos, and yet Amos didn't give up, but recognized that the Lord had called him to proclaim that message and continued faithfully to carry out the Lord's will and his word to those people. We're reading from Amos chapter 7, beginning with verse 7. Thus he, that is the Lord, showed me. Behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, 
flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread and there prophesy, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the royal residence. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of the prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tenderer of sycamore fruit. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Here ends the words of our Old Testament reading. Alleluia, alleluia. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to those who trust in him. Alleluia. Please rise for our gospel reading. The gospel reading for this morning is found recorded in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. During this Trinity season, we have been following the chronology laid out by the evangelist Mark in our gospel readings, working from the beginning of Jesus' ministry to, his, to the end. Once again, here in the Gospel of Mark, we see that the witness of Christians as they proclaim the Word of God is rejected by the world. We'll see in our gospel reading how King Herod, as well as others around him, also rejected the message of another witness of God, that of John the Baptist. We're reading from Mark 6, beginning with the 14th verse. Now King Herod heard of him, that is Jesus, for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is the prophet, or like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, he said, this is John, whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When the, his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Here ends our gospel reading. Join this morning to make confession of the same faith proclaimed by Amos in the Old Testament and John the Baptist as well as we proclaim the truth of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We'll be using the words of the Apostles' Creed as it is found on page 12 in the front of your hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We'll continue with the singing of hymn 264. This hymn is found in the Reformation section of the hymnal and fits well with the message of both Amos and John the Baptist as we pray that the Lord would continue to keep us faithful as he did Amos and John, that we too might proclaim faithfully God's word of truth to the current world that we have been placed in. Hymn 264.
Please rise. In letter to the Hebrews, the writer tells us that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That word of God, which we are considering this morning, is found recorded for us in the words of Psalm 85. We read, to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin, Selah. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. This is the word of our God. You may be seated. In the name of our Savior Jesus, in whom righteousness and peace have kissed. Dear fellow redeemed. Do you ever compare yourselves to the heroes of the Old Testament or the New Testament? Do you ever look at the lives of the prophets like Amos or Isaiah or maybe some of the New Testament prophets like John the Baptist or the apostles Peter or Paul and look at their lives and ask, how did they do that? How were they able to stand up against such fierce opposition by the world and remain faithful? How did they, how did they do what they did? I don't know about you, but many times as I'm reading through the Old Testament or the New Testament, I look at the examples that the Lord has given to us in those heroes of faith who have gone before them, and I look up to them with awe. I wish that I could be like them. I wish that I could stand as firm and faithful as they did. How did they get there? Where did they get that strength, that fortitude to be able to stand firm in the face of difficulties? How can I be like that? In reality, as we take a look at those examples that we have, both in Amos in the Old Testament this morning and even John the Baptist who gave his life for the sake of the witness to the Word of God, we need to recognize that that is really our Christian calling as well. We're not any different than Amos of the Old Testament or John the Baptist of the New. It is for that very purpose that God has placed us here in our life today. It's for that very reason that he has brought us to faith and continued to nurture our faith so that we too, like Amos and like John the Baptist, can faithfully proclaim the word of God to a world that is hostile to it and even rejects those who are sent to proclaim it. We have been brought to faith and given God's word of truth 
for the, that very reason. And not only have we been brought to faith, but that's the very reason that the Lord has not taken us from this world of sin to be with him in heaven, that he might use our witness to bring others around us also to faith in him. As we consider the verses of Psalm 85, we see the foundation which the Lord lays for all of his witnesses. Those prophets of the Old Testament, the apostles of the New, he lays for us a foundation for the witness of God's people. We find it in three sections in Psalm 85. We find it in the confession of God's people as we confess God's favor toward us in the past, as we pray for God's mercy upon us in the present, and as we declare God's salvation for us and for all people in the future. We pray that the Holy Spirit would strengthen us, that we too might be faithful witnesses of his word of truth to our current world and generation. Amen. One of the very important foundations of our Christian witness to the world, the witness that was proclaimed by many who have gone before us is the confession of our own sins. In the opening verses of our text, the psalmist says, Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sins, Selah. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. What you might notice in those first three verses is that each one of the verbs that's found there is found in the past tense. It's describing what God has already done, what he has completed for us. You have been favorable. You have brought back. You have forgiven. You have covered. You have taken away. You have turned from. God has already accomplished the work that is necessary that we all need because we are sinful. Built into this declaration of what God has done in the past is an admission, a confession of our own sins. God's favor has been shown to his land by bringing his people back from captivity. He says, you have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin. Now remember that this is written in the Old Testament. And while the the ultimate salvation that God would accomplish is yet in the future for God's Old Testament people, yet the psalmist describes it as already being complete. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin. Your wrath has been taken away. The fierceness of your anger has been turned away from your people. God knew what he was going to accomplish through the suffering and the death of his sin. In God's mind, that work was as good as done, even here in this Old Testament period. And as a result of knowing what he would accomplish through his son, he forgives the iniquity of his people. He covers their sin. They didn't deserve it. In fact, as we look at the message of Amos from earlier, we see over and over again through the prophets of the Old Testament that God's people, even God's people, did not deserve the forgiveness of their sin. They too constantly fell into idolatry. They constantly neglected the word of God, the word of the prophets that were sent to them. They too were full of sin. We, like the people of the Old Testament, like Herod in the new, are full of iniquity, full of sin, and deserving of God's wrath. The very foundation for our witness as believers, as witnesses of the Savior, the one and only Savior from sin and from death, begins with our own recognition of our failures, our frailty, 
our human condition which has fallen from God. And yet present here in the admission of our own sins is the recognition that God too is faithful. God is faithful in spite of our sin and through Christ he has forgiven our sin. He has made us his very own by his grace. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 the Apostle Paul said, and you God made alive who were once dead in your trespasses and sins. We didn't deserve it any more than the people of the Old Testament deserved it. And yet God's faithfulness has been demonstrated also to us. He has brought us back out of sin, made us alive that we might be his people, that we might declare his praises to the world around us. Think of all of the examples that we have throughout Israel's history of their rebellion against God. Think about how many times the Lord stepped into history in order to deliver his people, to provide for them, to graciously forgive their sins and deliver them from whatever they were facing. Think of how the Lord delivered his people from slavery in Egypt in spite of their complaining, whining, and groaning throughout the wilderness wandering, the Lord provided food for them and ultimately delivered the land that he had promised to them into their hands. Or you might think about years later during the period of the judges. In spite of the rebellion of God's own people, he constantly raised up new judges that would there be there to deliver them from the oppression of their enemies. Through the period of the kings, the Lord sent his prophets to speak God's law and his gospel to his people to lead them away from sin and back to the true worship of the true God. We might even think of the period of the Babylonian captivity when because of their rejection of the Lord, the Lord had taken them away from their homeland into captivity in Babylon. And still the Lord sends prophets to assure them that he would bring them back to that land which he had promised that he might fulfill his promise of a savior for them and for all people. Consider our own lives. Consider how the Lord has also been favorable to you throughout your life. How he has constantly and graciously forgiven the iniquity of your sins, covering up your failures. The Lord also has been favorable to us. He has turned the fierceness of his anger, which we deserve, away from us, showing us instead his grace found in his Son. The foundation for our Christian witness to the world begins with our own confession of sin and the recognition of God's favor demonstrated to us in the past and in the person of Jesus. That foundation continues with prayer, praying throughout our lives that we might ask for the Lord's mercy also in the present. In verse 4, the psalmist says, Restore us, O God of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. Now notice in these verses that the shift changes from what God has done in the past to what we are asking God to do in the present. This is a prayer to God that he would forget those things that we have done, that he would continue to direct us, that he would put his anger away from us in the present, that we might continue serving him throughout our days. How often do we neglect the importance of prayer in our daily lives? Failing to take up that privilege that the Lord has given to us, that ability to communicate with him and setting it aside, thinking that we're too busy to come to the Lord in prayer. It's easy for us to come to the Lord in prayer when difficulties surround us, but 
Are we often like those nine lepers who failed to return to Jesus and give him thanks when that deliverance has been given to us, when our prayers have been answered? Think about the examples of those, again, who have gone before us in their lives of prayer, of Daniel, who went up into his upper room and prayed regularly to his Father in heaven, even when it was illegal to do so. Or you might think about the example of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah is full of prayers of Nehemiah as he prayed in various situations that the Lord would bless the work of his hands for the benefit of his people and for his witness to the world around him. Think about the prayers of Peter or Paul or the example of Jesus who teaches us also to pray. Part of our prayer life also and again involves the importance of confession of our sin in our prayers. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? That prayer life that the Lord has given to us is a natural way for us to humble ourselves before God to recognize and confess that we can't do the work that is before us on our own. We need God's help. Those who have gone before us made use of this gift of prayer in order to receive the Lord's strengthening and encouragement to be united with the Lord in their relationship and in the work that they had before them as well. We need to recognize the bigger picture that is before us here. It's not just the immediate situation that we face right here and right now. But prayer causes us to look at the bigger picture. The psalm also emphasizes not just the immediate need for prayer, but that our prayers are broader than just our individual or immediate situations. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. When we hear that word salvation, we don't want to think, and we shouldn't think, of immediate salvation for the personal, individual situation that I'm in right now. But the broader context of salvation as a whole the recognition that we need the work of God in our lives. We need what Christ has done for us in order to deliver us from death, to grant us the privilege of being with him in eternity. Deliverance not just from this immediate circumstance or situation, but to recognize that it is the Lord's kingdom as a whole that we are praying for. Now, there's no doubt that the individual situations that we face are related to that bigger picture, the Lord's kingdom as a whole. But our prayers should focus not just on us, on me personally, but to ask that the Lord would give us wisdom, guidance to be able to see how my life fits into that bigger picture of God's kingdom around us that we would ask that the Lord would deliver us from this immediate situation so that we can serve him and his kingdom in that bigger picture, that we might be able to preach the gospel, that we might be able to witness by our lives and by our actions and words to those who are around us. Restore us, O God of our salvation, that we might rejoice in you through the granting of your salvation. Prayer, too, is an important foundation for the witness of God's people, that we might ask for the Lord's strength to say what we need to say, to do what we need to do as faithful witnesses of our Savior. That confession and prayer leads us also then to the outcome of declaring God's salvation, which is for us in the future. In verse 8, we read, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints, but that let them not turn back to folly. 
When we look at the examples of Amos, Isaiah, Noah, John the Baptist, Peter, Paul, or John, we might ask, how did they know what to say and when to say it? How were they able to remain so faithful? They weren't always faithful. We have examples of each one of those men falling short from what the Lord had actually called them to do. But it was the Lord who was behind each one of these witnesses, giving them the strength that was necessary so that they could proclaim God's word of truth. <coughs> the psalmist begins this in verse 8, saying, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. When Amos was sent to the northern kingdom of Israel, he was rejected by the people of Israel, by the king, by the priests of Israel. He was told to go back to his land. We don't want to hear what you have to say. And yet Amos didn't turn around and return back. He said, the Lord has given me a job to do. He has sent me to prophesy to his people of Israel. That foundation for us in being able to proclaim the word of God in the world in which we live begins with hearing what the word of the Lord is. If we aren't strengthening our own faith through the regular reading and hearing of God's word, if we aren't making use of those means of grace which God has given to us, we are not going to be prepared and equipped to be able to stand firm on God's word of truth. The psalmist says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. All too often, we are more like Amaziah, the false prophet, the unfaithful prophet and priest, than we are like Amos. When we don't value God's word, when we don't make it a priority as we should. Here the psalmist encourages us to see our own errors, our own failings, and strive not to fall into those errors again. Let them not turn back to folly. That was the message of Amos. That was the message of John the Baptist. Don't go back and fall again into that same sin which the Lord has delivered you from and which he has paid through his own precious blood to cover these final verses. Verses 9 to the end look ahead very clearly to that blood which has covered our sins. The prophet, the psalmist here says, surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. What an amazing contrast. If you look at those words again, you'll notice how again salvation is emphasized. That the Lord's salvation has been given to us. And that salvation has become ours in a strange way. In verse 10 he says, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. It was at the cross that this strange meeting took place where mercy and truth met together, where righteousness and peace have kissed. God's righteousness, which demanded that our sins face the justice that they deserved, met with peace at the cross of Jesus. As he took upon himself the debt of our sin and the punishment for us so that we might be set free. It was there in the blood of Jesus and his death that the mercy of God as well as the truth of his divine justice against our sin met once and for all, securing for us eternal salvation. In the death of Jesus, God's righteousness and peace kissed. 
And there at the cross, God's mercy and truth met once and for all. And now, as a result of God's promise, preserved and fulfilled at the cross of Jesus, what do we see? That truth springs out of the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. The result of knowing what God has done for us and the cost in which he paid, it causes us to follow in those footsteps of our Savior, to faithfully declare his name and his salvation in encouraging one another in the unity of our faith, but also in proclaiming and declaring that salvation which God has accomplished for us and which is reserved for us in heaven to the world around us. God offers us the very same gifts that he offered to his Old Testament prophets and to the apostles of the New Testament. There's no difference between Amos or Isaiah or John the Baptist and ourselves. The very same opportunity is laid before us and the very same power to accomplish what the Lord lays before us is also found in his word, which is still given to us. This is why we are here. This is why the Lord has called us out of darkness through his word of grace, that he might use us as his witnesses to our family, as parents to our children, that we might raise them up and instruct them in the truths of God's word, that they might have a solid foundation throughout the days of their life, and that they might join with us in singing God's praises in eternity. May the Lord bless our faithful witness to his word. May we rejoice in the salvation which he has won for us, that word of truth which he has given to us, which proclaims how righteousness and peace have kissed in the person and the work of Jesus. May we, throughout our lives, value that salvation and proclaim it freely to the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Congregation may be seated. This morning we'll continue with the singing of hymn 793. When our organist this morning saw that we were going to be singing this hymn, she came to me and she said, are you sure that's the right hymn? It's in the Harvest and Thanksgiving section, which seems to be inappropriate for the Trinity season. And yet you'll notice as we sing this hymn that it is based on the final verses of Psalm 85 and how fitting it is that we do enjoy Proclaim the salvation which the Lord has given to us and the many other gifts which he so bountifully supplies for us. And in that final verse, that we recognize that we, having been given that gift of grace, use it to declare the Lord's praises throughout our lives. We join in the singing of hymn 793.
Oh, Holy Spirit, teach us the life of loving service, which we ought to live to God out of gratitude for his love, which sacrificed Christ for our sins. Through the death of his son, he has made us his very own. Help us then to be dedicated wholly to him, freeing our energies, our abilities, our time and our possessions, yes, all that we are and all that we have, from a life of serving ourselves to a life of serving you. Do this, O Sanctifier, by filling us with the love of Christ. O Lord, you have made us your stewards in a very special way, entrusting us with your holy word. Teach each one of us that this word meant for our own continual use is also ours to share with others, that they too may learn of the Savior's love for them and believing in that message may ultimately be saved. Help us and guide us so that we may determine how best to serve you as stewards of your word. Help us also to determine what portion of our time we will give in personal witness to the gospel of Christ. Help us determine what portion of our energies and talents we will use for God's work in the congregation with its various programs of Christian education, service, and worship. Help us to determine what portion of our earthly possessions we will use to support the ministry of the divine word, both in this congregation and through our synod at large. Give to parents the ability to train their children in Christian stewardship so that even from youth they will acquire devotion to every Christian work and learn early in life to share the responsibility for preaching the gospel. We pray this morning for those mission helpers which are serving you in Kenya, Tanzania, and Zambia. We ask that you would be with each one of the teams, that you would guide and direct them, that you would use the struggles that they face in foreign lands in order to strengthen them and to give them dedication to serve you. Use the word which you have given to them and which they proclaim to increase faith in those who have heard your name and also to create faith in those who have not. Bless their service to you, both to their own great joy and to the glory of your name. O Holy Spirit, we also ask that you would bless the offerings of time, talent, and treasure that we make to God for his kingdom. Let them be for each of us a delightful privilege and self-evident fruits of our personal faith. Since only offerings given out of love for Christ are acceptable to you, Increase our love by diligent use of God's word and frequent attendance at the Lord's Supper. Forgive all of those times where we have failed to be good stewards and inspire us to dedicate to your use all that we are and all that we have. We ask all of this in the name of our Savior Jesus, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessing and promise of our triune God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Mm -hmm.